During my segment one driving classes, my friend and I teamed together with a certain instructor. We would find ourselves mostly listening to the stories of his youth instead of learning concepts of driving. One day he told us a story when he used to work the night shift at a gas station. This event occurred in the days when people were hired to pump gas for customers. On this night a van pulls up to the station. The driver is slumped over with his head almost resting on the steering wheel. My instructor starts to get nervous but shakes it off. Whilst pumping the gas, he notices the van's sliding door is slightly ajar. The door slides open and a man, holding a butcher's knife that clearly has blood on it, lunges out after him. My instructor sprints across the lot while being chased by the man. There's a chain link fence at the edge of the station lot and he manages to climb over it. Running into the field on the other side, he stops and looks back in time to see the man, halfway over the fence, hop down and run back to his van. They speed away immediately and my instructor calls the police. Apparently the man was wanted for a series of crimes and was found and arrested shortly after this night. It was around 11 at night and I had just finished working out at the gym. I went to the grocery store to pick up some food for the next couple of days. While at the grocery store I decided to get $120 cash back, money that I owed my mom and unbeknownst to me as I left the grocery store, money that I came so close to losing. Instead of going straight home, I decided to go for a little drive. I just got my car not long ago and the novelty of driving stick hasn't worn off yet. After about a half hour of driving around the city, I decide it's about time to head home. As I pass a gas station on the edge of town, but close to my house, I decide that now's a good time as any to pull in and fuel up. I pull in, and I'm the only one at the gas station. I'm in an industrial business part of town, the edge like I said, so there isn't much around. There's an empty lot that's without light beside the gas station, and I notice an SUV sitting there about 100 to 200 meters away, but I don't think much of it. I get out and start pumping gas when I notice a woman come around the corner and walk straight towards me. As soon as I notice her, a shiver ran down my spine. I instinctively locked my car. She walked towards me quickly, hands in her pockets, staring at me pretty intensely the whole time. I got in a fight with my boyfriend and he left me here. Can you give me a ride to my mom's house? She said casually in a raspy smoker's voice. Another chill ran down my spine as she repeated the question, word for word almost, in the same raspy voice. Uh, I have to pump gas first, I said to her, keeping my eyes on her the whole time. She walked around to the passenger side door. Beside me, fuel port is on the passenger side and grabs onto the door handle. Can you unlock your car? I'm cold. I've been here a while. I have to pay for the gas, I said, deciding to cut the gas pumping short. I walked inside and talked to the guy behind the counter. I told him the girl outside was kind of suspicious and I didn't know her. He just kind of shrugged and I could tell he wasn't interested in getting involved so I walked out. I figured she was high or something but I would find a way to just get her to leave me alone. As I walk out, the SUV that I had mentioned earlier started up. I watched the driver maneuver himself so he could just drive out the exit. He stopped, engine still rolling. He was still like a hundred meters away. Can you open the door now? I'm really cold. So many alarm bells were going off in my head already. First, she just looked sort of sketchy. She was dressed well enough, but her face was pretty rough. She was pretty covered in makeup, but it didn't hide a nasty looking sore in her lip. Her sunken eyes were dull, bloodshot, and just dead looking. Second, she didn't seem like a damsel in distress, not at all. She didn't seem upset and she spoke without much emotion. No, that's not my problem. I need to go home. I said to her as firmly as I could. Come on, you're driving me home, right? I can't. I have to get home right now. Reaching for my phone, I realized I had left it in the car. I'm cold. I've been out here for hours. She shouts, pretty angrily for someone who's asking a favor, I thought. Then I noticed her look at the SUV. I started cluing into what was going on and raised my voice a bit. That's not my problem. I'm at the driver's side door now. I'm freezing, you'd said you'd drive me home. 
That's not my problem. I started raising my voice. She started raising hers. We weren't yelling, but it was getting a little heated. We went back and forth like that for a couple of minutes. My mind was racing. I thought about losing my car and about getting stabbed or shot, about getting robbed for the $120 I had in my wallet. I just lost it on her. Get the fuck back. You do not know who I am. Get the fuck back right now. I guess I was in fight mode at this point. I was pretty ready just to fucking clock this bitch if she tried anything, as awful as that may sound. I think I caught her off guard or something because she stepped back right away. You better get out of here right now then, she said, walking backwards. I instantly felt my balls tingle sadly and climb up inside me after she said that. I was out of fight mode and into fucking flight mode. I watched her until she got a decent distance away, noticing she was walking sort of towards the SUV. I didn't watch for much longer. I hopped in my car and peeled the fuck out of there. I turned into a random subdivision making sure I wasn't being followed. I called the cops and they said they'd send a car but there wasn't much that they could do because there was no real crime committed. But I did the right thing and she was most likely bait for some kind of robbery. I drove home as quick as I could. I go to a private Catholic university in the downtown of one of the most dangerous cities in America, or it says so in most articles I've read. Next to my dorm, there's a little gas station that sells snacks and stuff. I go there pretty often because they sell Ben and Jerry's ice cream, and literally everyone needs that in their lives if they don't already have it. It was about 1pm and I was headed to my next class. I thought I would stop there and pick up a snack before class. I was waiting in line holding my yogurt and all of a sudden this huge guy, probably 6'5", 250 pounds, mid-twenties, taps me gently on the shoulder and tells me my hair is beautiful. I'm somewhat used to this encounter because I have really long, naturally strawberry blonde hair. I smiled warmly and turned back around. Nothing about this man scared me at first. Out of nowhere, I feel a huge hand slide up the back of my neck and grab a fistful of my hair. The guy groaned and yanked back. I'm by no means strong or able to defend myself against this monster of a man. I'm 5'2 and about 140 pounds. I screamed and whipped out my pepper spray that was on my keychain. Luckily the guy behind the counter dove over the desk and slammed him off of me. I was still in a weird state of shock at that point. The guy who pulled him off of me was super kind and made sure he left before I went outside. Weird things like that have happened to me living down here. I've been in this city for almost my whole life, but never this physical and in broad daylight. So my boyfriend and I were pulling an all-nighter, being the computer addicts that we were, and at about 7 in the morning we decided to run to the gas station just outside of our neighborhood for some energy drinks. We pull up and park on the side of the building, away from the busy pumps and he goes in by himself to grab the drinks. As he enters I see a man at the corner of the store, leaned up against the wall, drinking something from a paper bag. He eyes him as he enters and then flicks his attention to me. I get an uneasy feeling but stay calm because I knew he shouldn't be more than a few minutes. Sitting here, alone, he edges closer and closer to the car. I start to get really scared and start shaking a bit. I feel a rush of relief when my boyfriend finally returns, but I can't help but notice that the guy is still watching us. As soon as my boyfriend turns the corner towards me, the guy starts following him. I freeze up. I have no idea what this guy is about to do. My boyfriend walks faster. The guy keeps pace. And right as he reaches for the car, the guy starts making a fast grabbing motion towards his throat. I throw open my car door and start blaring the car horn. The guy scowls at me and backs up to the wall. My boyfriend jumps in the car and we peel off. I can see him as we drive away. His hand is now down and he's just muttering to himself. About 10 years ago, I worked for a short time at a small gas station close by to my house. Both of my kids had started school and we always needed extra money. I was about 26 or 27 and had not ever really worked anywhere before, 
but it was fun. We stayed a little busy throughout the day as there were three factories very close by and we'd get a lot of our traffic from the employees there, especially at shift change times. One weekday mid-morning I was working by myself, which was unusual, but my manager, who usually worked days with me, was out sick. No big deal. It was no more than I could handle. There were people in and out all morning and nothing out of the ordinary was happening until a transfer truck pulls in and parks to the side of the building. We didn't carry diesel fuel, but it wasn't unusual to have big trucks pull in for drinks, bathroom, or whatever. The driver walks in. Tall guy, not unattractive, but a little creepy looking. He had a huge refillable coffee mug and asked me if there was fresh coffee and if he could fill up his mug. I told him no problem. He fills his mug and comes up to pay and starts chit-chatting. He told me that he had a delivery for one of the factories up the street and asked what would be the best way to get in there, so I told him, no big deal, happens all the time. He then started telling me how he was from Arkansas and that after he dropped his load, he was headed back home for a few days. I was just politely nodding my head. Then he asked me if there was a restroom. I told him yes and pointed to where it was, but did not come out from behind the counter. He starts trying to chat with me again, without going to the restroom. He asked me if I was working alone, and that's when all kinds of signals started going off in my head. I told him my coworker had to run an errand and would be back right away. He winds up staying in there for about 20 minutes, trying to small talk, and asked me at least six or seven times where the restroom is. During this time, customers were coming in and out, and when someone would come in, he would walk around the store, kind of behind the shelves. At this point, I'm trying to stay calm and figure out what I need to do to get him the hell out of here. I looked out at the gas pumps and saw a man from one of the factories up the street on a forklift filling it with gas. When he comes in, I was trying to start a conversation and ask him stupid questions to get him to look at my face so I could gesture where a creepy guy was standing behind the potato chips. He didn't catch the hint until he walked out of the door and turned back to look at me and I mouthed to him, help me. He turns around and comes back in, and by this time creepy guy had come out from behind the potato chips. Forklift guy asks me if I am okay, and I tell him no. He asks if I needed help, and I say yes. All of this being said very low where creepy guy cannot hear. All of a sudden forklift guy runs around the chips, slams creepy guy into the coke cooler, telling him that the lady wants him to leave and to get the fuck out. Creepy guy runs out, jumps into his truck, and hightails it out of there, while forklift guy stays with me until I call the police, and they get there. I make a report, gave my best description I could, called a co-worker to come and stay with me, and the police and forklift guy leave. About an hour later, one of the cops come back in to tell me that they caught the guy speeding on the highway leading out of town. He not only had an empty trailer on the back of his truck, he had not been to drop off his load, he didn't even leave in that direction, and no way did he have time to get to the factory, unload, and get back out to where he was pulled over in that amount of time. But he also had a pistol that had been reported stolen in Alabama, and had just been released from prison where he had served two years for rape and was wanted in Missouri for not reporting into his probation officer after being released. I have no clue why he was in a transfer truck or what the hell he was doing in small town Georgia, but he clearly was making his rounds through the southeast. This happened in the fall of 1993 when I was 20 years old. In the interest of context, this was before I started college and I was working in the material prep department of a plastics factory on the night shift. I was the only woman in the department and my male co-workers were initially skeptical that I could handle the job but I proved myself and earned their respect. It was hard work, but on the plus side, it also put me in the best shape of my life. It was also about this time that I dumped my abusive boyfriend. He was verbally, emotionally, and physically abusive, as well as an alcoholic. This fact, more than anything, is probably why I got myself into this situation in the first place. I had just gotten off of work and it was about 1.30 a.m., my car was running on fumes so I stopped at a local gas station to fill up. While I was pumping gas, a woman about my age approached me looking nervous and scared. 
She said that she had been at her boyfriend's house and they had had a fight. She had walked to the gas station to use the payphone and call a friend to pick her up. On her way to the station, a car pulled up as she was walking, and the guys inside started catcalling and harassing her. With a slight movement of her head, she indicated a car that was parked off to the side by the gas station dumpsters. I saw a large light green car, like a caddy or a Lincoln, with at least two or three shadowy figures inside. She said they threatened her, and she was too scared to call her friend and wait. The woman was neat, well-dressed, and didn't seem high or drunk or anything like that. She just seemed really nervous and freaked out, so I didn't even hesitate. I finished pumping my gas and told her to hop in the car, that I'd take her home. At that time on a weeknight, there was little traffic, so I booked it right out of the gas station and asked her where she lived. She kept twisting around in the seat to see if the car was behind us, and when I asked her to put her seatbelt on, she ignored me and kept looking for the car. I assumed she was just scared. A few blocks down the road, however, I noticed she was looking around the car, and she started asking me about money. Where's your purse? Where's your bag? I need money. You need to give me money. My stomach sank. I have this woman in my car, and now she's gonna rob me. Fuck. But when I thought about it, robbery just didn't make much sense. I was driving a 1985 Chevette, affectionately nicknamed Shitbox, and was wearing my work clothes, a ratty t-shirt and jeans with combat boots. I did not look like a person with a lot of cash, primarily because I wasn't a person with a lot of cash. She twisted around the seat again and started yelling. There they are! There they are! She didn't sound scared anymore. I checked the rearview mirror, and sure enough, the light green car is right behind me. She started cackling and bouncing up and down the seat. My boys are gonna fuck you up, bitch! They're gonna fuck you up! She's laughing like crazy, opening the glove box, looking in the back for a bag or purse, telling me all the messed up shit these guys are planning to do to me. Now if I had been smart, I would have just driven to the police station. Actually, if I had been very smart, I would have called the cops from the gas station and waited with her until they arrived. That would have been the intelligent thing to do. Unfortunately, none of this crossed my mind until later. In the moment... I just got really, really fucking angry. I realized three things all at once. There was an intersection up ahead, with cars on either side waiting to cross, and the light had just turned yellow. I had a spare box cutter that I kept for work in the driver's side door compartment. The crazy bitch still hadn't put on her seatbelt. I didn't think. I floored it and passed under the yellow light just as it turned red. I glanced back to see if the green car was still behind me, but the cross traffic at the intersection had started to move, and they hadn't caught up. The bitch started yelling. I slammed on the brakes and she hit the dash and windshield with a solid and viciously satisfying crack. When she rebounded to the passenger seat, I had the box cutter in her face and was screaming some serious batshit crazy. I can't remember exactly what I said, but it was along the lines of, Get the fuck out! Get the fuck out of my car before I cut your fucking face and make you eat it, bitch. The crazy screaming and box cutter combo worked. She grabbed blindly at the handle and popped the door open, and I started shoving and punching her until the bitch tumbled out the door to the curb. I stomped on the gas, got to the next turn and squealed around it with the passenger's door still open. I made a few more turns because I was afraid that the green car might catch up to me. After a little while, I stopped to close the passenger door, and I then cut across town and got onto the highway to go home. I was on the highway for about five minutes before the shake started. I pulled up to the shoulder to calm down and get my shit together, and then I drove home. I told my older sister I was living with her temporarily after the breakup with my ex and everything that happened. She wrapped me in a tight bear hug while simultaneously yelling about how stupid I was for not going to the police. I've never been so glad to be yelled at in my life. A couple of years ago, one of my closest friends relocated cross-country with his long-term girlfriend to work a job he couldn't refuse. Only issue he had was that he didn't want to fly his dogs out with him when they'd made the move since they'd be staying in a hotel for the first month. 
He was also a bit reticent to fly them out due to health concerns for both pets. By the time he located a home to rent, he was missing his furry babies and made the request of his sister, another close friend, and myself to drive them to him in LA. Now we are Chicago folks so the trip would be a long one. However, with the three of us to foot the near 30 hour drive, it would be a piece of cake. We left early and drove long hours. Along the way, it was decided between my friend and I that we'd foot the majority of the drive ourselves and, if we needed to, we'd let our friend's sister do some driving. We were in a bit of a time crunch due to a snafu with the rental agreement, so we didn't have the luxury to stop very often past an 8-hour stay at a Denver La Quinta Inn. As for the journey itself, it was relatively smooth, barring getting pulled over right before entering Utah for driving two miles in the left lane of an empty highway. Whoops. From that point, we made it through Utah, Arizona, and Nevada without much problem until we entered California in need of gas. I had been driving for the majority of the first day and tagged my buddy in after being pulled over. I remained in the shotgun seat as navigator, searching through the GPS for a fuel stop. We kept our eyes peeled for road signs and discovered a sign pointing to Yermo Ghost Town or something along those lines which had a mobile station. How wonderful. It was convenient too as it wasn't located almost directly off of the interstate. We rolled in on a little more than fumes when we approached the pumps. Normally we'd let the dogs out at every rest stop but having stopped not long before then and with both dogs sleeping snugly in the back, I decided to pump gas without anyone else leaving the vehicle. My buddy pulled up on the opposite side of a beat up green sedan with a short, plump gentleman who just turned in to approach the shop. I noticed a few other hoopties at the pumps, all unoccupied and there were a couple of other cars parked up near the station, most likely belonging to the employees so nothing seemed out of the ordinary, until I swiped my credit card. The pump rejected my first swipe attempt which I chalked up to a misread. I swiped again, and the pump read, Please see attendant. I was annoyed, but we needed gas. I tapped on the window and told my buddy what I was going to do and asked if anyone needed anything. After taking their orders for Gatorade and Marble Reds, I walked up to the store to make a mental note of how strange this gas station was. Kind of quiet, especially for one right off the interstate, but it's no matter. As I walked in, though, more weirdness. First thing I noticed is that there were some boxes of chips just left on the floor, like someone was stocking shelves and just quit. As I veered to my right, I noticed immediately that there was no one milling about in this place. With the six cars besides my own out there, I felt like I would see someone. Things got even weirder when I realized that there was no one behind the counter, no customers or workers. And then it dawned on me, what happened to that gentleman who was at the pump adjacent to mine? Surely they can't all be in the bathroom. This is where I began to feel this gnawing sensation in my stomach. Something isn't right. I have always been a person who felt like I could always trust my instincts, and those instincts were screaming at me to just get the hell out. I want to run, but I hold back. I would look suspicious booking it out of the gas station that was empty and decide to just play it cool. Natural. Don't let your body language let on to how badly you're freaking out in your head. I was probably inside of this gas station for only a couple of minutes when I left, but I stopped just before exiting to listen for something, anything. A flushing toilet would have been a good sound, but nothing. As I exit the shop and see my car, I begin to feel dread. It's like that moment in the movie where the hero is about to make it to the end of their trial, but the celebratory fanfare disappears, and in that silence, something comes and strikes them down. I'm about 25 yards from the car when I see this gentleman come out from around the side of the shop opposite of me. This is not the same man as I saw while pumping gas. He was larger and had a peculiar look on his face. And the best way I could describe it was like Nick Cage's smile from face off before the titular act had occurred. I continued walking towards my car, but when I turned back to look at him, he was now walking towards me with a purpose. At this point, I got the fuck back to the car with increased urgency in my step. And of course, my friend has the door to the car locked like a complete douche clown. There is also the 95-pound golden retriever sitting in my seat. Apparently, my travel companions did not notice how freaked out I was, 
or the creepy gentleman still walking in my direction. I punched the window and told him to unlock the fucking door, to which he only half rolls down the window to tell me the dog was in my seat and they were afraid she'd jump out when he opened the door. I reached my hand in and threw the dog towards the back seat as hard as I could while my friend is just now realizing how freaked out I am. He started the car and drove off quickly. I took one last look back and see Nick Cage had stopped about a pump away from where we were, still with that same look on his face. We found another gas station further down the road, this time with a ton of people inside and out. After thoroughly creeping out my friends with a story as I pumped gas, we made our way back to the interstate, which meant passing that gas station again. It's been about 15 minutes since we pulled out initially, and we go silent as we notice that those very same cars are still sitting in the same spots where we had left them. After thoroughly freaking out for a few miles, I received a phone call from my credit card company about a $100 charge at a mobile station. The lady on the phone was really helpful in fixing the situation for me and was as entirely creeped out by the situation as we were. In the end, we made it to LA and had a great vacation, but it still bothers me as to what the hell was going on at this little gas station off the highway and what the hell was that smiling man's story. A little over a year ago, I worked at a gas station it was one of those 24-7 ones with a mini-mart in it. Its motto was literally, we never close. And I worked the evening shift, between midday and midnight. Now I saw and dealt with a lot of fucked up things in that store, which just led me to roll my eyes when people were doing, saying something creepy, wrong, aggressive. Hell, if I had one dollar for every time I was threatened with death, I could retire. One night I was out in the store restocking shelves when one of the creepy regulars came in and started talking to me. He was a full druggy bogan. Bogan means redneck in Australian, think people of Walmart style. He would have been in his 50s when the drugs have taken its toll and he was tweaking whilst hitting on me. By this point in working in that festering hellhole, I had just learned to deal with it. Don't ignore them, they get angry. Don't act interested. They get clingy and sure as hell do not agree to anything. He was saying some fucked up shit, something about what he wanted to do with me. I zoned in and out of what he was saying. It wasn't uncommon for him to ramble about perverted acts and other gross things. I tell him I have to get back behind the counter because my coworker needs me to make coffee for a customer. We were trained to use an actual coffee machine, none of this coffee pot stuff. He was a bit irritated but said he would talk to me later and then left the shop. After making coffee, I had to restock drinks, but the day team hadn't emptied the trolley of boxes, so I, all bite begrudgingly, took out the boxes to the big bin. This bin is located around the side of the store. There are no cameras, and the people inside can't see out to it. They used to make me nervous, but I have been there longer than some of the people who had come through and was used to the environment. As I was throwing the boxes in the bin, the tweaking guy from before comes up to me and grabs my arm. I tried to play it off like he is goofing around by laughing and saying something like, Hey, Fred, I know you like me, but you can't get all touchy-feely on me. The husband will get mad. Sounds like I wasn't trying much, but with people like him, it was best to remain friendly with his type. The last time someone was more firm with him, they got knocked out by his right hook and I was the lucky girl who got to witness it and call the cops. So Tweaker tightens his grip to a painful point and says in an angry voice, I told you I was going to have my way with you. But this time I have stopped smiling and am now scared. He shoves me against the bin and goes to unbuckle his belt when glass smashed. One of my more favorite customers were across the road at the pub and I'd see him go straight for me and knowing his reputation, wanted to make sure nothing bad was happening. And when he saw what was happening, he smashed his bottle of beer over his head. Cops were called, and I didn't see him again. As for the guy who saved my ass, so to speak, I gave him free coffee for a month. As for the boxes, I refused outright to take them out anymore. My co-worker did it instead. He traded me for cleaning the restrooms. 
I recently drove from Philadelphia, PA to Buffalo, New York with my cat. The ride was long, but we were making decent time for the most part. She and I had gotten up toward right before you got into New York. It was around 5.30 p.m., but that also meant it was around pitch black out too. We'd only stopped once to get something at McDonald's, and I drank their iced tea quickly to try to stay awake. I definitely had to pee. I didn't want to leave my cat in the car, so I put her leash on, and we walked into the gas station. I said, do you mind if we use the restroom here? The man behind the counter said sure, and she and I entered into the bathroom. She sat on the counter while I did my thing. The store wasn't empty, there were some dudes around browsing for honey bun tasty cakes and cheaper cigarettes than those in New York. There was a woman talking to the counter guy up front, she was probably like a regular based on their seeming familiarity with each other. My cat jumped about a foot when we heard the doorknob rattle. I laughed and said, Sorry, it's occupied right now. My cat is a trained animal. She is trained to handle people, stimulating situations, crowds, and relatively loud noise. She hates cars though. I look over at her after the jump and her tail was as full as it could be, and she got low and slipped up to her favorite position on my shoulders. She dug into my hair with her nails and did her little grumble at me that she does when she wants to be let outside. The doorknob rattled again, and she reached out toward the door like in a quick way like a strike. It's still occupied, I called out, but I wasn't laughing this time. We then heard someone speak. It was a man's voice, and honestly it kind of made my blood run cold. They were speaking a cousin of my native language. English is not my first. They were saying, Should I grab her when she comes out? And in my native tongue, grab doesn't really have the multiple connotations like it does in English. Let me grab them before they go. I have to ask them something grab a bite to eat, grab by the hair, etc. They used what was similar to take, as far as I could tell through the door. No, the cashier is right here. We can go stand outside, I think her car is the blue one. My cat did her angry grumble bug sound, and I tried to pet her to reassure her. There weren't any windows in this bathroom, and my car was parked unwisely around the side of the lot. I parked it a little way from the lights because I had a lot of stuff in it and didn't want the items to be lit. It was not the blue one. We heard their steps retreat and we sat there for what felt like a long time. We both jumped when we heard a knock on the door. Come out quickly. My girlfriend will lead you through the back to your car. They're standing out by the pumps. It was counter guy and who I thought was the regular. I opened the door and she ushered me to the back. Not smart but I didn't know what else to do. She opened the door and I could see my car about 20 feet away. I wanted to sprint, but I remembered I used my key thing to set the alarm. I unlocked the car with my keys and the alarm went off. I have deep cuts for my cat from this. Sorry, madam. I threw myself into the driver's seat, unlocked it with the key thing and quickly pressed the button to lock it again. I felt my heart in my throat as I threw the car into reverse and got the fuck out of there. On my way out, I noticed the guy standing near the blue car on the other side of the lot, trying to nonchalantly smoke. They didn't even know I got out. I work evenings as a dispatcher in a medium-sized Midwestern city. I was driving home at 2am when I stopped for gas. In retrospect, it was stupid to have stopped at all. The gas station was poorly lit and completely empty of any other customers, but I knew the shady areas of the town, and this was not usually one of them. As I was pumping gas, I noticed a middle-aged black woman sitting on the curb across the parking lot. It was a cold night and had just started raining. The woman was not wearing weather-appropriate clothing, so she was drenched. When the woman saw I was watching her, she called out to me from across the parking lot. My second of many stupid decisions that night was choosing to engage with her. I was worried for her, so I approached her to see what sort of help I could offer. Hi, beautiful. I was just trying to get home, but no one will help me, she said. I'm just trying to get to Melbourne, but the cab ride is $60 and I only have $40. Can you help me? I don't usually give money to panhandlers, but this woman seemed genuine. The weather was terrible and my job centers around helping people, so I agreed. I told her I didn't have any cash, but... If she would come with me inside, I'd take some money out of the ATM and give her a few dollars. 
but the ATM wasn't working. I apologized and told her there was nothing else I could do for her. She followed me back outside, idly chatting with me as I opened my driver's door to get in. And then, she got in my car. I was too shocked to really say anything. I sat staring at her as she buckled herself into the passenger seat. As soon as she got in my car, her demeanor changed entirely. She no longer seemed forlorn as much as she did extremely, extremely excited and restless. Just take me to my aunt's house, she said. She can give me money. Of course, alarm bells are going off in my head. Although my first instinct is to tell her to get the fuck out of my car, my gut tells me that would be dangerous. She'd already proven to be unpredictable. She also seemed to be high, and I didn't know if she had any weapons on her. Forcing her out of my vehicle, I thought, had the potential to elicit a violent reaction. Where are you asking me to take you? I finally said. Just start driving, I'll tell you where to turn. No, if you want me to consider driving you somewhere, I need you to tell me where we're going. I say, with no real intention of driving her anywhere. Don't worry, honey. I'm not one of them bad blacks. I'm not going to rob you or nothing. Just drive. No, I repeated. What is your aunt's address? Okay, it's Circle Bend. What's the house number? As I was asking her the question, she got really agitated. We still had not left the gas station parking lot. I considered getting out of the car and going to the gas station to ask for help, but A, she had seemed to know and be friendly with the one attendant that was inside when I tried to get money, and B, I wasn't about to leave her alone in my car. Finally, she snapped at me and said, Why the hell are you asking me so many questions for? I thought we were friends. You don't trust me? Is it because I'm black? I work at a police department, I said. It's my job to ask these sort of questions. She flipped the fuck out. She started yelling at me about being a snitch, about trying to get her in trouble, just in general losing her damn mind. At this point, I'm more scared than ever. I just wanted her gone, but my instincts told me asking her to get out of my car wouldn't work, so I decided to take a risk. I'm not a police officer, I just work at a police department. Why don't I take you to Walmart and see if they have an ATM that works? My idea was to get her out of my car as peacefully as possible, then lose her in the store. She liked my idea and immediately calmed down. I knew that driving off with this woman in my car was incredibly, incredibly risky, but it seemed like my best option at the time. As we're driving, she keeps talking to me. Her thoughts were erratic, bouncing all over the place. It sometimes seemed difficult for her to follow through with a thought, but this is roughly how our conversation went. I'm glad we're friends now. I have about five or six people trying to get me. I'm going to come to your work tomorrow so we can go arrest them together. Okay, uh, we can talk about that tomorrow. Tonight you said you were trying to get home? Yeah, honey. I'm just trying to get to Cloverfield. Cloverfield? I thought you said you needed to go to Melbourne. Yeah, yeah, Melbourne, that's what I meant. That's why the cab ride is $40. It's far away. The cab ride is $40? Yeah, baby. You said you have $40. I do, baby. I have $40, but the cab ride is 60 Are you sure you can't take me to my aunt's house? She lives close by on Cherry Street. I thought you said she lived on, like, Circle Bend or something. No, baby. I meant Cherry Street. But it don't matter because she won't give me money anyway. You, you sure you can't just take me to Melbourne? It was terrifyingly obvious that this woman was utterly full of shit because the details of her story were constantly changing. And when we pulled into the Walmart parking lot, she finally got out of my car, only after I got out first and followed me into the store. I told her before we went to find an ATM I needed to use the restroom. My plan was to call the police from inside a stall, but she followed me into the bathroom and that's when things got really weird. She grabbed the crook of my arm and whispered into my ear, If you don't got no money to give me, that's okay. But let me ask you something, sweetie. Do you like getting your pussy ate? I told her no, as forcefully as I could manage, bolted into a stall and locked the door as fast as I could possibly manage. As soon as I had a barrier between us, I said, You know, I have some friends at the police department that can probably help you better than I can. 
I'm just going to call them and we can figure this out together. Again, at the mention of cops, she started screaming at me. I just kept reiterating that the police would help her. She snapped at me that she was going to leave and stormed out of the bathroom. But it wasn't over. I waited to make sure she was really gone. Sure enough, not 60 seconds after she left, she came back into the bathroom and started banging on the stall door. She said something that scared me more than anything else. Hey, come back to your car with me. I left my beer in your car. I blatantly tell her that no, I saw her get into my car and she had absolutely nothing with her other than the clothes on her back. After that, she left the bathroom again and didn't come back. I waited a good five minutes before exiting the bathroom. I immediately found a manager who called the police for me. Thankfully, I was in a different police jurisdiction from the one I work in because I was mortified at how entirely stupid I had been the whole night and would have died of embarrassment if any of my co-workers had responded. The officer that responded took my statement and advised me to be more careful in the future. He said that sometimes panhandlers turn violent and that just recently there had been a report of a woman who matched my description assaulting a good Samaritan that had stopped to try to help her. I definitely learned a lesson on stranger danger, and I'm lucky to have come out unscathed. I'm glad my stupidity didn't kill me. So friends, the next time you try to help a stranger late at night, don't. At about 8pm last night, I was walking with a friend of mine, Sally, about a mile to the closest cafe. We're both girls in our early 20s, neither of us own cars. Sally didn't have her Opal card, which is the Aussie version of an Oyster card, basically an automatic ticketing system for public transportation. So walking was our only option. It's summer over here, so it was still fairly well lit, and we're walking down main roads, so we're not too concerned. We finally arrive at this cafe and sit down. I was paying, but I only had my credit card, and sure enough, it was cash only. Sally was on the phone when I got back from the counter, so I gestured for her to stay put and guard the spot while I went to get cash. This is my home suburb, so I know there's no ATMs around, and my best bet is a gas station about a block away. I'm doing a light jog, so I don't keep Sally waiting, when a balding, sweaty guy probably in his late 40s with a tank top and no shoes come pacing behind me as I passed the corner of the block. He walked behind me for about a hundred meters. I didn't really think much of it. The gas station was the next building along. It seemed like he had just come out of a nice suburb house along the street and it wasn't the witching hour, so I just assumed he was going to the station like me. He didn't even cross my mind as I entered the tiny convenience store, nor did he follow me in. In my peripheral, I saw him walk past the door and out of sight. I looked around for an ATM they sometimes have inside. No such luck. So I go up to this man in his 30s at the desk and reluctantly ask if they're able to do cash out. He smiles and says of course, and then asks, is he with you? I have no idea what he's talking about at first, and then points to the man from earlier, pacing around outside the store. Keep in mind, he didn't look at all menacing. He wasn't going back and forth just outside the door. He was drifting in the space outside, from the pavement to the gas pumps to the storefront seemingly aimlessly. I assumed he was on drugs. I tell the clerk no, not thinking much of it at all. He says, oh, he was just staring at you before. I thought he may have been your dad. I laugh it off. I honestly wasn't concerned at all. He was still ambling around outside and I couldn't imagine him having a fixed gaze on anything. I thank the clerk for the cash, but before I turn away to leave, he says, just wait and see if he leaves first. We wait for a few minutes in silence and the guy begins to pace back and forth directly against the front of the store, looking straight ahead and never into the store. It still looked like the man was just on a drug-induced amble and seemed harmless. Not once did I catch his gaze, so I figured it would be safe to just slip out the door and walk back to the cafe in the fairly bright light of dusk especially since Sally was texting me at this point asking, where are you? I thank the guy at the desk once again for his concern, assure him I don't know the guy and am not involved in some weird scheme to rob the store, and head for the door. The clerk asks if I want him to walk out with me. I say that I should be alright, and begin walking away from the block. 
As I leave the store, the drifting man stops pacing and makes a beeline for me from the other end of the building. I seriously didn't think much of the guy at all until this point, but for the first time he was briskly walking in a straight line towards me. The hairs on the back of my neck stand up, and I start power walking so that he doesn't think I'm actively trying to escape him, still trying to convince myself that I'm just being paranoid and should be more casual. I don't look behind me to see how close he is. I've reached the pavement on the other side of the gas pumps when I hear the clerk run outside. He's yelling at me. Go! Run! Run! I make a break for it, looking over my shoulder. He's grabbed the man by his shoulders from behind. The bald man isn't even glancing behind him or trying to escape. He's just watching me run away. That's pretty much the end of the story. I keep running until I cross the road and then turn around, standing still. The clerk is still just holding on to this odd, staring man. The clerk and I are just looking at each other in bewilderment, not really knowing what to do. He makes a hand gesture to go and I gesture my thanks. You know, the clasp your hands together and shake them a bunch of times. I got back to Sally with the cash and bought food before walking back home a different way. Overall, nice gas station attendant who went out of his way to help my naive self. I'm definitely glad we met. I live about 20 miles from the city in which I work. I live in the country and about a short walking distance from my house is a highway and on the corner is a 24-7 gas station. Last week, Saturday night, I went by there right before midnight to grab some Cajun peanuts. I see one car parked on the side, which is normal, usually just a guy working and rarely any customers at this time. Do you ever feel this dread overcome you, like you know something is wrong? Well, I walk in and don't see anyone, nobody behind the counter or in the store, so I take my time and assume they are in the bathroom or step to the back of the store. Surely they heard the chime on the door when I came in. I'm feeling weird and uncomfortable so I wait a minute, even though it seemed like forever, so I call out. Anyone here? I wait a minute more and put the peanuts down and walk out the door. I check the car parked on the side and there wasn't anything troubling. I even glanced on the back side of the store and there was nobody. I'm pretty uncomfortable so I just call the police. They show up 10 to 15 minutes later, but it really did feel like an hour, and they search the place. They find the cashier dead in the men's bathroom, beaten to death. They called in backup and asked me to recap what I experienced, and then I went home. That ain't even the fucked up part. So I get home, and my dog is in the front yard pissing and just staring at me. He's an inside dog, and my front door is cracked open. My heart is racing, so I grab my dog and head back to the gas station to let the police know. They send one of the guys to search my house. Nothing is stolen or out of place, but there was sign of forced entry. Now, this was last week, and about five hours ago I get a call from my brother who works for the county sheriff's office. Supposedly, they pulled the camera footage and about ten minutes before I walked in the store, someone came in, started punching on the cashier, and then dragged him into the bathroom. On the footage you can see me walk in and look around and call out. Then you can see me walk out and check out the car, walk to my vehicle and make a call. About the time I'm in the vehicle, the alleged murderer walks out of the bathroom, sneaks out the back door, and before leaving the view of the camera, he takes off in the general direction of my house. Fortunately, my wife was out with some friends watching Beauty and the Beast, but I'm convinced that I missed a murderer at the gas station, and then he broke into my house. This week I had a new security system installed alongside a new front door but I'm pretty sure whoever did this is still out there. Hey guys, thanks for listening. If you can't get enough Let's Read, I would be honored if you would support me on Patreon, where for only a dollar or more a month, you will have early access to narrations up to 24 hours before they're released on YouTube and any other exclusive goodies that I feel like dropping on there. Thanks again, guys, and we'll see you again soon.